Well, we're back with Colossians. Class 5, not much more to go. We're here in chapter 3, and I love I love chapter 3. And tonight we're talking about how the loved live. How we live from this passage. In previous classes we've talked about the supremacy of the Son of God, focused on the Christ's identity. Then we talked in the next class about how Paul's intention was to serve the Son of God by helping the Colossians to live out their Christian life. The third class was about fullness, which is really about God's dream for us to enjoy the fullness in Christ. And then last time we talked about freedom, which is our privilege. That we are privileged to have freedom in Christ. This week... How the love live. I'm going to ask Chris to read the passage for us, if you would, and then we'll get into it now. Uh, the church said, Amen. 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 Say amen to that, can't you? Uh, what a fantastic passage. Um, we have here, at the beginning of chapter 3, what many would regard as the pivotal passage in the, uh, in the letter. Everything before leads up to this, and from this point on, at the beginning of chapter 3, we have, since then since we've already looked at all the issues to do with the supremacy of Christ, therefore, this is how we live. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the letter um, runs through that point. Here, Paul is drawing together subtly the errors of the false teachers that have been <coughs> trying to distract the Colossians, and he provides an alternative, providing a spiritual background for the encouragement of how to live. We do need the spiritual perspective of who Christ is and who we are, before we can figure out how to live. And just as a side point, this is very important in our parenting and in our uh, discipling of one another to Christ. The way that we help each other grow is not just about saying that this is how one should live, but it's placing it in the context of who God is, who Christ is, who the Holy Spirit is, and who we are in His eyes. And then how to live makes sense. Paul does this in all of his letters, and we can take a lot of instruction from that. So what he's saying is, um, in this passage, in a uh, brief summary, is you were over here, now you are here, you've left that behind, you've turned away from it, you have seen that it is not of God, so don't go back there, and don't be tempted back there. So many of the writings of Paul have that theme. He's talking about how we are in Christ, we're with Him, we're raised with Christ in verse 1. Uh, we are, uh, need to set our hearts on things above where Christ is, and where Christ is, we are. In some, to some degree already, we have the ones called the already but not yet. We already have our salvation, but it's not yet fully experienced in the way that it will be with God forever. And so he said, you are raised with Christ, you are seated with Christ, Though you're not yet fully there, but since that's the case, since you share in his risen life, uh, our interests now are lined up with Christ's interests. Whatever he considers important, we consider important. And, uh, and in fact, his interests are our interests. He says we should uh, set our hearts and set our minds on things above, and that's in, uh, put in the sense of an ongoing effort. It's a continuous thing. <clears throat> so it's not just something we did at repentance or a baptism or after a particularly um, a sermon that cuts us particularly to the heart, but it's a, it's a lifestyle. And I think that's a very important thing for in my life, I've discovered, and I'm sure it is in yours, that repentance, the way of shifting our minds, shifting our hearts, is a, it's, it's a habit that Christians have. It's not just something we do uh, once or twice in our lives. We continue to set our minds, continue to set our minds on things above. We uh, ponder things above and we yearn for things. We, we focus upon things of Christ's desires and we yearn for them. We desire them greatly. And of course, if we ponder things above and we yearn for things above, then that cures us of our unhealthy attachment to material things, <coughs> viewing them as being of greater significance and importance than they really are. 
And so Paul gives us a couple of reasons here for setting our hearts and minds in the right place. First of all, he says, you died. And your old life, your old way of thinking, the worldly way of doing things is dead. You've made that decision. And secondly, your now your life is hidden with Christ in God, meaning that our lives are, are secure. Our relationship with God is secure. No one can take that away from us, as Paul writes in Romans 8. Our, our new life is held in safekeeping for us by one who can't be plundered. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but every time I leave my house and I'm the last one to leave and there's no one at home, I feel a little nervous as I shut the door and think, did I lock all the doors? Did I close all the windows? <clears throat> if you have an alarm, did you set the alarm? We used to have a dog, didn't need an alarm, but now we don't have a dog. And I, I feel less secure and I always wonder, it happens every time I leave the house like this, when I go home, what will I find? Will, will a door be broken in? Will a window be smashed in? Will a burglar have been there? I'm making some of you nervous right now. I'm sorry about that. But I don't want you to think about that distraction. But, I, but there's always the possibility of being plundered in a material sense. But with Christ, there is no possibility of plundering. No one can take away your salvation. No one can take away your relationship with God. It is secure with God. Our new life is held in safekeeping by the one who cannot be stolen from. We're safe in him, doubly so, because in this passage he says, it's in Christ and with God. It's more in Christ and with God. We've got both Christ and God. Your life, verse 3, is now hidden with Christ in God. Right. If you thought, you know, Christ could be plundered, at least God can't. Not that <laughs> either of them can. But he's just saying it's like double secure. And so, that's exciting. Christ is now our lives. So, I, I particularly love this passage and find a great deal of help from it because a number of years ago, um, I don't know what, where or why or how, I forget now whether it was a conversation with somebody or a book I read or something, but I started using Colossians 3, 1 to 4 as an almost daily uh, beginning to my prayer time. Mm -hmm. And I use it nearly every day mm -hmm. as I begin by saying, God, thank you for this new day. Help me please at the beginning of this day to set my mind on things above and to set my heart on things above. Please God help me with that because I know I'm weak and I need your help. I know you put your spirit in me to help me with this. But I want to consciously choose that again today. That I'm going to set my heart on things above, set my heart on things above and, and then I expand on that usually with just the idea of I want to desire what Christ desires. And I want to think about what Christ thinks about. That's what I want today. And uh, I believe if I can have that at the beginning of the day, it helps me a lot with the issues that come up to distract me <coughs> through the day. So particularly for me personally, that's one of the things that helps me in my, in my prayer life. And so I put that down as a suggestion on your handout. Now you'll notice on the handout um, that there are lots of questions. Um, some uh, sober moments, sobering moments, and a few suggestions. And there's lots of footnotes with lots of extra scriptures. Because there's so much in this passage we don't have time to deal with tonight. So I hope that in doing that, you will be able to take it away and do your own Bible study and thinking and praying and talking about it with one another in a way that's helpful. So we're going to talk about three points after that sort of introduction in the first few verses. What we're going to talk about is things to put off, things to put on, and things to put in. Put off, put on, and put in. So I think that fits here. Yeah. Verses 5 to 11, we'll talk about being, things being put off. We've got two lists here of five sins in Colossians 3, verse 5, and Colossians 3, verse 8. Uh, in verse 5, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And then in verse 8, we have another list of five anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. Okay, there are five what are sometimes called graces in verse 12. Um, uh, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It's interesting you've got five and five and five. I don't think that's by accident. There's some kind of thing going on there. Paul perhaps helping them to remember uh, things. So I've got a question about you. For you, with the, with the list in verse five and eight, the, the list of sins that he talks about there, uh, what's the difference between those two lists? We've got two lists. The first one, immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desires, and greed. The second one, uh, where were we? Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. What's the difference? What do you see there? Really? Is uh, the first list not a little bit like Galatians 5, the 
the acts of the sinful nature, the sort of more external, obvious stuff. And then the second one is like the one Timoth two Timothy three list, the more subtle internal stuff. More internal, more subtle. Okay, good. Yes, I can see that. Anything else you notice that's uh, a bit different between the two of them? One is for men and one is for women. <laughs> <laughs> ourselves in many ways. The other list, uh, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, is what does come out of us and it wounds others very directly, which is uh, relevant to what Paul's going to talk about in terms of relationships uh, in this passage, but also later on in, in, in Colossians. So um, now we're told to put these sins to death. Put to death, therefore. All right? That's very clear as an instruction. How? Do, what does that mean? Let's talk about that first. What does it mean to put these things to death? What do you think when Paul's saying, put these things to death, what can that mean for a Christian? I think the, the idea is you put them to death, they can't come back. Okay. So it's, it's like you, you deal with them once and for all. Okay, deal with them <laughs> seriously. <laughs> all right. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. um, <laughs> the uh, passage. Uh, yeah. We're uh, just talking about our sin, and if your if your eye pulls you down, get out of your hand, because you didn't cut it off. Okay, so it's about being radical about yeah. sin. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Take action. That's Take it. action. Yeah, it's not something you just wish would be dead. You have to actively work on putting it to death. Okay. You can't just pray about it and think now it's think now it's gone. It's something you have to work on. There's something dynamic. Yeah. That's it being expected or at this point, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, it has to be evident in your lifestyle because in verse 7 where he says you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, okay. so there's an implication that, you know, in your lifestyle it should be evident that these things are gone. Okay, all right, so some uh, people think that when Paul's saying uh, put these things to death, he's, he's saying reckon them as dead, remember that they are dead, as in, Christ died for you, that's your past lifestyle, that's dealt with, bear in mind that that's how you used to live. Some people would say that, and there's a, there's, you know, you can argue that. But I would suggest that it is more about taking action in the present moment, because we have commands uh, of, along these lines. There is act, action expected here. There does seem to be as an implication of a decision in this context, um, and there are a lot more, there are, there are other therefores and calls to decisive action in this passage. So there is something, and I think perhaps it's the radical point, because, as you said, if possible, what was the phrase you used, if we can put these things out of our lives completely, but you and I know that, that, that dealing with the sinful flesh that we have is a progressive thing in the Christian life. Mm. And the idea that from today to the day I die, I will never lust again, is I'd like to, to think I c could, and maybe somebody can, but I don't think it's going to be me tomorrow or this week. Mm. But I do think that I can take a, a serious attitude. Like, I want to put that to death. I really want it to die. And if I want it to die, I will take different action from if it's just, well, it's just one of those things that happens to Christians. Mm -hmm. So it's about an attitude, presumably, as much as anything. So let me ask you this. How do we put these sins to death as Christians? All right, Jesus already dealt with them, they're forgiven. But how do we, what Paul's saying here is, put them to death. So how does a man or woman of God do that? What does it mean, do you think? Yeah. Well, I think... Um that if you pray about it every day, it's on your mind all the time to try to 
stay away from it, if you know what I mean. If you pray about it regularly, it helps, John. I, I think what God wants is, is a change of heart. So, uh, when, when I, I, there was a point in my teenage years when I went to church and I wanted, I, I didn't commit sexual immorality, but I would have liked to. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 so, but now I don't want to. Uh, so my heart has changed. Uh, where uh, I, I, I may I may stumble, but if I do, I would repent because that's not what I want in my life. Mm -hmm. So I look at my old life and I think, yuck. Mm -hmm. I don't think, oh, I've had to leave all of this behind. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't want it. <coughs> so I think that that's the, the heart that God wants mm -hmm. for us. Uh, and, and then we may stumble, but repentance would be a way of, of continually putting to death. <coughs> Continuing to go back to that attitude, of that, that attitude of heart, yes? Um, I just think it's a conscience thing. If you're praying about it all the time, it's on your conscience, so therefore your conscience will guide you. That's how I feel, not to do these things. That if you think about it, you suddenly think, no, you mustn't do it because your conscience is working all the time. That's a great point. Can I ask one question follow-up from you to that? Not to deny the fact that both of you said about praying about something, that we don't want to get, we don't want to sin in some areas, we should pray about it. Not, not to deny that at all, we should pray about those sort of things. But what might be a possible danger of focusing a lot of prayer on something? You get consumed by it and you end up doing it. <laughs> so your focus, that, your focus is pain. on the thing mm. that you want to get away from mm. <coughs> instead of you said, don't look back. Look. Forward, so okay. So, what are you going to watch? What's what's the goal when when you strain to achieve or go yeah. for or 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 in a way, it's, it's like Peter saw the waves, he sank. Okay, but he focused on Jesus, he walked on water, and I think that's excellent. Okay, so without belaboring the point, but I think that's right. It's it's right to pray about things. Nothing wrong with that, mm. but it needs to be the right perspective on prayer that we're asking God to help us to have our hearts lined up with what we really want, as John said. And so we're not focused on the sin, we're focused on Christ yeah. and on what he's going to do in our lives. That makes a big difference, I think. Okay, we, we'll have to move on. We can talk about this stuff for a while, <laughs> couldn't we? Um, we put to death the simple lifestyle by depending on what Christ has done for us. It needs to be about Christ, not about us. I can't, I'm never going to solve issues in my life or become more Christ-like by just thinking about all the ways in which I'm not Christ-like. Mm -hmm. It's, I've got to have my eyes on Christ, which is why the chapter begins with set your hearts on things above, set your minds on things above. And in the context of Christ being the big fi figure and factor in our lives, then the issues that I'm dealing with become much more placed there with Christ instead of just me struggling with my energy and, and all of who I am, which is obviously going to be inadequate. Um, we died at baptism. Uh, we did die at baptism and our sins were for forgiven. But uh, I don't know about you, but I have occasionally uh, f uh, fissures in the surface and little volcanoes pop through and sit. And, you know, we, we have to deal with those. We have to be alert to those and be sober about those and be realistic with ourselves that uh, we do sin, uh, but God has enough grace for us. So we've got some sins listed here. We haven't got time to do, deal with all of them in detail, but sexual immorality, how might you define that? Anybody want to have a crack at defining sexual immorality? Several syllables, but what does it mean? Really? I read an interesting uh, definition which, which helps me. It says that it's any sexual gratification outside of marriage. Okay. Yeah, that'll work, I think. Anybody want to add anything to that? Okay. Does kind of cover it all, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Porneo. Indulging in sexual immorality of any kind. Uh, <coughs> and uh, 1 Corinthians 6 is another reference of you've got there. Impurity. Anybody want to hazard a guess of defining impurity? Well, I, I think that uh, gratification, impurity, is, is, is thinking about stuff. Okay. In the mind. Mm. In the mind. All right. Uh, a state, in the Greek, the state, akakwasia, the state of moral impurity, especially in relationship to sexual sin. 
Uh, it's also applicable to, for, to forms of moral evil. Uh, a Greek writer called <coughs> Demosthenes uh, used it of someone who, was, who pretended to be someone's friend, but then committed perjury to do him an injury. So pretending to be a, a friend and an upright person, but actually being something else. So. Uh, greed. Let's talk about greed for a minute. For uh, planoxia, anybody want to define that for us? Give us a an idea of what you think the problem is here. Yeah. I think it's when you just never really had enough or never really happy with what you've got. You've always got to have more at the cost or expense of anything, really. You know that's well, that's yeah. how I would. A dissatisfaction that leads to ongoing mm -hmm. attempts to acquire more than one needs. And sometimes, you know, you know, with that kind of drive, you may, you know, you don't, I'm sure, eventually care how you acquire it. You know, it could be at the cost of something or someone or, you know, and one's integrity obviously will be compromised because if you never have it, what you've got. All right. A, a definition I read just for us, a strong desire to acquire more and more material possessions or to possess more things than other people <coughs> have, all irrespective of need. Interesting thought. Okay, we're going to have to keep moving on, but why is greed idolatry? Because he says here that it's idolatry, which is greed, which is idolatry. So what's going on there? Why is he linking greed with idolatry? Yeah? Jesus talks about not serving two masters, okay. we only serve one. We two have... masters. <laughs> yeah, so... Problematic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? Do you want to add something? Yeah, it's related to that, but I, I think we can... Um, uh, that, uh, rely on wealth instead of God. Okay. What are we relying on? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Can rely on the stuff instead of the It becomes the idol. <coughs> okay. Mm. So greed is a problem. Um, it uh, takes the place in the heart that should be reserved for God. <coughs> it consumes us. Greed consumes, and uh, therefore it pushes God. Um, <coughs> it's not. It's not about wealth. It's about greed. There's mm. a difference. Right. All the difference in the world between those two things. Mm. There are problems come with wealth. There are problems with wealth. There are problems with poverty. Mm. Not the same problems, but there are problems at both ends. But this is not the issue here. Uh, it's about uh, greed. Okay, it's making ourselves our own God. I am going to get for myself what I want, and therefore I am the center of my life, and God no longer is. So the sober moment. I put in some sober moments for you mm. in the <laughs> handout there tonight. The sober moment to reflect on is do you have any of these things taking new root in your life at the moment? They were cast out, they were dealt with, but have they grown some new, is it spring for any of these uh, sins in your life at the moment? Uh, and, and before you answer too quickly and say no, I've added the question of what would a close friend say? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Friends. A friend. Wow. A, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Um, moving on, um, why wrath? It's interesting, it says that God's wrath comes with, with this. Because of this, the wrath of God is coming. A quick point. Um, some would say it's not, you know, it's not loving of God to exercise wrath uh, when sin is in existence. But uh, someone put it this way, sin attracts God's wrath like a magnet attracts iron filings. Or a steeple attracts lightning. It's just one of the things that happens. Because God is pure and just, his wrath is attracted to sin. And actually, it's a forewarning. This forewarning of, if you've got this sin, wrath is coming. It's a forewarning. The forewarning is evidence of God's merciful nature. Because if he liked toasting people, he would never give them a warning. Yeah. True. So his intention is clearly that no one gets toasted. Wow. And that's why we have the warning. Mm. So, I've got a suggestion at the end of that bit there. Um, oh yeah, where do we come from? Uh, Colossians 3, 7. You used to walk in these ways, the ways of the life you once lived. When's the last time you sat down and reflected on what your life really was like before you were a Christian? Just in your mind's eye, going back there. In your heart, going back to how you felt about your life and about what was going on. Maybe it's not a bad idea to use a quiet time to pray about that and write down what was it like five years ago, 20 years ago. Just remind yourself how you used to walk to see the difference and now how you wish 
to walk. So and that's a suggestion. Uh, we put off these things. Apostasy is the Greek. We put these things off. We cease doing what we were used to doing. We've stopped those things. The word to get rid of is to mean literally to put off, like taking off a set of worn out clothes. I don't know about you, we vary in the approach to clothing. Some of us uh, like to buy new clothes and, and feel good about discarding the old ones. Some of us like to hold on to our old clothes, even when they've got holes in and they clearly should have been uh, put in the bin a long time ago. I'm the latter. Uh, I have jumpers in my cupboard that I only wear in the garden, and Penny is very glad I only wear them in the garden. And I actually have three of those kinds of jumpers that I can wear in the garden, and I really only need one. But I really like all three. And you know, we've probably all got things like that. Uh, it, it, that's not how we should regard the sins that make us feel good for a while, but actually destroy our relationship with God. So. Okay, we're going to need to move on. What do all these sins have in common? You can have a quiet time about that. Uh, anger. Um, the word anger there, the orge in the Greek, it's the, the Greek writers use this anger like a, it's like a dog that barks before knowing whether someone is friend or foe. Mm -hmm. It just barks anyway. Just, it just comes out of its mouth. That's that kind of anger we're talking about here. Or the impetuousness of a servant who rushes off to do something before the master has finished giving instructions. It's that impetuosity. The rage, a sense of intense anger, passionate outbursts, malice, strong dislike, feelings of hostility, the implication of doing harm, slander, blasphemia, speaking against someone in such a way as to harm them, to injure them, and their reputation. Filthy language, ice obscene and shameful speech involving culturally disapproved themes. In other words, what might be filthy language in one culture might not be in another. Certain words and phrases, we, you know, we've got an international group here, we know that some words are okay and they just mean slightly different things in some cultures than others. We won't talk about those in public right now, but you, you know that kind of principle. But we need to know what is regarded as the language and the culture in which we live and make sure we avoid that. Sobering moment, any of those taking root, okay. We're taking off this old stuff, verse 9. Uh, take, you've taken it off. The word take off is, is like stripped off. You've stripped off this old self, don't put it back on. And uh, you've got Christ now, you're being renewed into his life and into whom he is. There's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised. We're one in Christ. We're all the same. I think it's important that we remember how um, Christ has made us one in his sight. That's not important when we get on with people. It's very important when we don't. And when we just don't see, them to see eye to eye with another member of the church, or our family group, or even our own family, that we are all equal in the sight of Christ and equally loved. Um, I'm very moved by the situation with our churches in the Ukraine at the moment. And because of the politics of it and how I, um, sensitive it is, I can't say much publicly, but I can tell you more privately later if you like. But the tension between Russia and Ukraine is very high. And we have many disciples in the churches in Russia and in the Ukraine. And it's very, they're very nationalistic countries. And there are many disciples who have a nationalistic fervor. And you can imagine it's difficult. Maybe we can't imagine, but you can try. But the first, when, when, when uh, uh, a couple of churches in the Ukraine had to move, move, all the members had to leave their cities, basically. They had no jobs and nowhere to stay. And there was an appeal put out for the churches around our movement to, to help give money for the Ukrainian Christians, which also were then at 50% unemployment with hyperinflation because of the war. The first church to take a, le a collection was the Moscow church in Amen. Russia to send money to the Ukraine. Mm. Now you've got to bear in mind, there are members of the Moscow church who've had family members killed in the war, killed by Ukrainians. Mm. But they got family members killed. Not killed by Ukrainian Christians, but nonetheless by Ukraine, and yet they took a collection to send it to the Ukraine. I think it's a great testimony to what God can do, what man cannot do. Okay. Let's make sure that we, in less dramatic ways, do not allow division in amongst ourselves. We are all one in Christ because of what Christ has done. So we put off many things, then we put on some things. Uh, it's lovely to be chosen, isn't it? He says in verse 12, as God's chosen people. Don't you like being chosen? Well, chosen for a nice thing. 
<laughs> uh, not chosen to do the nasty chores, but chosen to do nice things. That's a great feeling, isn't it? It's wonderful. We like being chosen. We've been chosen. We're holy and dearly loved. I've given you many other scriptures that you could have a quiet time about that. And the fact that we're chosen is the powerful motive for Christ-like behavior. That's why we want to be like him. Now we've got these so-called five graces. There, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Patience. What's the old rhyme? Uh, patience. Uh, patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Seldom found in women and never in a man. <laughs> As my grandmother taught me that. Um, they are rare in this world though, aren't they? These, these qualities. They should be not... They may be rare in the world, but they should be in rich supply in God's people. Yeah. If we're going to be known for things, yes, yeah, let's be known for zeal and faith and those things, but let's be known for compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. If we're known for those things, don't you think that's like, that's the salt that we are, the salt of, of the earth being the light to the world. That's what is uh, needed. Defining those graces, we don't have time, so let me move on. But compassion, there's a sensitivity with compassion. With kindness, it's not just being nice, it's being providing something beneficial for someone as an act of kindness. Humility, considering others better than ourselves. Gentleness uh, can be translated meekness. Um, a, a striking example would be Moses. Uh, very gentle and a great provocation most of his life. Patient people are powerful. Think of Jeremiah, think of Hosea, think of Abraham, think of Joseph. Perhaps their primary quality was patience as they waited for God to come through. What about us? Mm -hmm. Don't we live in a, an impatient culture? Yeah. 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 Not all of the world has an impatient culture, mm -hmm. but I think we do. Yes. And it can be in the church too. Mm -hmm. I want my kids to be baptized tomorrow! Mm -hmm. I want my mum to become a Christian now. Come on, God, now's the time. Because I've decided. There's patience. Patience isn't passive, but it is trusting God for God's timing. Uh, I'd suggest if you recognize that one of these qualities is not strong, <coughs> or perhaps your friend might tell you it's not strong, then maybe look at a Bible character who has a strength in that area and study their life. We can learn so much from looking at Bible characters and studying their relationship with God and how that helped them with their qualities. And then he talks about forgiveness. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Bear with each other. Forgive one another. Forgiving is easy to speak about, very hard to do. Why is it hard to do? Because you get twice hurt. It's painful to forgive as it is painful to be hurt in the first place to then need to forgive somebody. Jesus forgave on the cross. He was in his greatest position of pain when he actually forgave others, and in forgiving others, it caused pain. It's, it's one of those things about forgiveness that is just Christ is the greatest example, and we need to pray a lot and help each other with. Stephen, perhaps, is the preeminent example of someone who forgave like Jesus as he was being martyred. Over all these virtues, put on love. Put it over the top because it's the most important thing. Love it, it covers uh, all the other things we're talking about here. And then finally, to put in. So we put some things off, we put some things on, and what do we put in? And by this, I'm talking about putting into the fellowship, because this is corporate here. Bear in mind, he's writing to a church. And when he says you, he's not talking about you as an individual, he's talking about you group of Christians. And so here, when he says, um, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, he's meaning plural. You as a group, be member, as members of one body, the body of Christ, the church, you are called to peace, be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell amongst you, plural, richly as you, plural, teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, psalms, through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts collectively, whatever you do collectively, whether in word or deed, with all the name of the Lord Jesus. So it's a collective thing. Just a couple of quick comments on corporate worship and corporate life together. You know, we are a plural you fellowship. Uh, we spend time together when we can. Uh, we value that because we don't have much time on this earth. So let's make the most of the time that we have with people. Get recharged on your own as much as you need, but then let's spend time with people. I was thinking a lot about this even as I was preparing this, and I realized that my, my time recently had been very uh, 
uh, been not had people in it as much as I think is healthy. And uh, so I, um, even tonight I arranged some, a prayer time with someone tomorrow morning, which I don't like praying with someone on a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll confess that. I, I like Saturday morning to be a little more relaxed, you know. And, uh, but I rang up his brother and said, you, are you doing anything tomorrow morning? He said, no. I said, do you want to pray together? He said, that'd be great. I was kind of half, half of him, so. <laughs> He was busy, but uh, he was free, so we're going to meet. Fortunately, it's a nice civilized time, like 8 o'clock, so uh, that's okay. Oh, that's but, early. You know, that's early? Okay, it's early. But uh, I, I, I realize that I need a bit more people in my life. Maybe you don't, it's different for different of us, but do, do you need a bit more people in your life? So it's a corporate, we're together? Uh, maybe. Think about it for yourself. It is together, this whole thing of worshiping together, living together. Uh, okay, we're going to need to wrap up here. Um, take some time this weekend. It's Friday night. You've got Saturday, you've got Sunday. Well, maybe the whole next, uh, this, next, this next week. Maybe take some time to go over the questions on the sheet there, the sober moments, the suggestions, pray over them. Share your thoughts with a good friend. Don't just keep it all to yourself. And let's help each other grow in Christ's likeness. Three things at the end there. Something for me to put off, to put to death, is, well, what might that be? Something for me to put on in Christ. Some compassion, some patience, some, what is it? What might it be? And there's something for me to put in. What can I put into this fellowship? Perhaps if you feel like you have been holding back a bit, what could you put in? Let's put off, put on, and put in. Amen to that. Amen. Amen.